This video is from my good friend Daniel, and we've been discussing some devices that he showed me in some pictures in an email I got from him. They're called monoblocks, I think, and it's a very interesting device he has. It's a huge electrolysis cell that uses a bunch of individual units, I think, and I wanted to post this video to share with him some of my findings that may help his machine. What we have here is the cathode of the very first electrolysis cell I ever built. The anode was a, another piece of stainless steel pipe that slid over this and the electrolyte would pass in through one port like this and out the other on the other side. The other side looked exactly like this except there was a pipe over it and you can see my electrical connections were made there but one of the problems with this stud is, is that it's made entirely of stainless steel and if you look at here the conductivity of stainless steel using the copper standard is 2.5 that is horrible as far as conductivity goes silver is 105 percent of the conductivity of copper this is called the copper standard um, conductivity chart and it shows you how conductive certain metals are in relation to copper wire pretty cool little chart so you see stainless steel is just way down there and okay so this is what I've got as you can see, the thickness of the tube did not degrade at all, and this sat in a solution of extremely concentrated sodium hydroxide, approximately 30% by volume. For about a year, it sat in that stuff. Um, this is the cathode. Now, it's black like that because it sat without running for so long. During times of operation, even a week after sitting in this stuff, it would still look like copper. So this is just from it sitting for an extremely long time. And this is the anode, which surprisingly is doing very well. It's extremely clean for an anode. But that's basically, I just wanted to show you what it looked like. Let's give this a scratch. It's a pretty thick layer of, sorry stuff on there but this stuff blasts right off there I don't know if you've ever done electrolysis cleaning before but because this is the cathode this layer would just blast right off there and the equations I did like unbeknownst to me it's amazing that I was actually cranking out 250 to 280 watts of heat alone just in the resistance of stainless steel in this cathode. So I, I sought a better way of doing this. Um, the reason why I like these monoblock cells is because they have advantages that the plate cells just can't offer. If you're building large systems, these devices are the way to go. Because you need a lot of them, of course, to get rid of the need for a transformer. Like you'd need like 40 of these things to run on 120 AC. So this here is the device that I told you about, Daniel. It is a copper cathode electrolysis cell. It's nearly completely disassembled. And basically what we have here is a stainless steel pipe with a copper bus that has been silver soldered to it. So I'm actually using this as the, the anode. And it, the stainless steel is merely acting as a skin. The actual conductor is this bus bar and these are copper wires that have been wrapped around it and the cathode is that copper pipe that runs through the system now this copper pipe is black because upon standing there is a slight oxidation process with the sodium hydroxide electrolyte that takes place but during operation it runs as clean as electrolytical copper it, it looks almost lustrous to appearance except it's not polished well, it doesn't have a luster. I mean, it's completely clean, but it's kind of fuzzy like that electrolytic copper um, deposits look. So this cell could put off a flame two centimeters long at, I believe it's 60 watts actual input power. I do have a video of this device running. It's called copper cathode cell, I believe, or something like this. I'm going to take this thing apart so we can better examine the, um, the state of the copper cathode. As I said, during operation, that thing will run completely clean. 
But um, the difference between these two cells is hugely significant. First of all, they both put off the same flame. The difference is this one did not get hot. These little ducts here were made to pump coolant through the cathode. Never needed to even hook them up. It just didn't generate any heat, no matter what I pumped into it. I pumped 200 amps into this thing, and it did get a little bit warm. But at 200 amps, this, the dimensions break down. That's too much gas and too small of a space. This device here, you're looking at about 1,100 watt unit. Both of these units put out the same flame. 1,100 to 1,300 watts, 60 watts. Now, I've put more power into this thing and got bigger flames out of it, but the losses in stainless steel could sometimes be up to 500 watts, depending on the voltages you use. If you use low voltages, those numbers I gave you do not hold up. You've got to take into consideration the voltages. Very important. This was a 5 to 11 volt cell. This is a 2 to 3 volt cell, which would also be attributed to the higher efficiencies. One more important detail that I forgot to mention about this copper cathode cell is that a second step I took was to eliminate nearly all stainless steel losses that I possibly could. And in this case, I am merely using the stainless steel tube as a skin to conduct my current. The thickness of this tube is the actual dimension, cross-sectional area, of my current resistance which is extremely low because this is really thin and because I have taken the time to braid this tube the way I did now you could just silver solder a coating over the whole thing and get a similar effect or something similar to that but one thing I noticed is before I bust this like this I was still getting some significant stainless steel losses so any way that you can distribute the current connection, it is definitely worth taking the time to do so because of the simple fact that copper is so much more conductive than stainless steel. If I had a connection right here and that was it, then I would have this total distance of stainless steel losses from my current. It would start out and just slowly dissipate down the tube and it would be a very horrible current distribution. You'd get a really good hot spot here, and then it would, you know, all that stuff. So, just a very important detail that I forgot to emphasize, and it is definitely something that is worthy of looking into entirely by itself in a whole video. So, very important to use stainless steel merely as a skin, and by no means do you want to conduct electricity through it. I know you know all this stuff, I just really like talking about it, and just in case... You know, we haven't thought about this. Sometimes a refresher is really good. So, there you have it. Here is some of the data that I took. And where is that at? This line here shows that I got an MMW of 5.3 out of this cell, which is phenomenal. It's better than anything I've ever built. Wasn't putting off a lot of gas, but hey, I was at like 8 amps, 2.2 volts. I mean, that's... Not a whole lot. Here are some of the specs. You can pause this video and look at some of the details. This was the first time I ran it. Now the reason why I dis disassembled this cell is because the power source was horrible. I didn't have the proper size transformer. Here are some other operation parameters of this copper cathode cell. Unfortunately, I do not have such detailed data logs of the stainless steel cell. It was basically before I took the time to do this kind of thing here. But these are all the specs that I took of this copper cathode cell. Bear in mind that a lot of the stuff you're going to see here is a result of the horrible power supply. This is the power supply that I use to run that device. It is, um, it's, it doesn't work well for the simple fact that it's DC. And you have to take into consideration something called distortion of current when you're building high output DC transformers. This device, based on the saturation point of this transformer, can only put out about 70 amps of current, unfortunately. The AC side can crank up to 800 amps, but you just can't do that with this unit. So that was one of the reasons why I sadly took this device apart. But here are some ideas I had for different shapes of the cathode. Perhaps if we put some slits in it, 
or maybe some holes so that electrolyte could flow through it and the gas would cause flow and we would be able to double the surface area of the inner cathode by cutting like a small slit or maybe holes at the bottom and holes at the top to allow electrolyte in at the bottom and gas and electrolyte flow out the top of that inner cathode here. Now I am going to disassemble this and hopefully cobble together a video for us to look into this but um, as I said I just thought it was interesting that you had built a unit like that and I wanted to share with you the possibilities of converting your cathodes to copper because it wasn't all that expensive at all in fact it's cheaper than stainless steel where I get my materials anyway I'm gonna take this apart see what's inside and I've got a couple other details I wanted to share with you because I think that if you ever built another one of those you would greatly benefit from ridding yourself of horrible stainless steel losses think about it 250 to 500 watts of my power was being dissipated purely as heat because of the metal I chose to use was only conductive by a factor of about 2.5 percent compared to copper so if you can make your cathode out of copper go for it now the reason why we can make a copper cathode is because hydrogen gas created on this cathode does not react with the metal the anode is where the problem becomes. So we made the stainless steel skin anode out of the stainless steel for the simple fact that the oxygen gas would devour this copper bar. If I were to make the anode out of copper, the solution would quickly turn blue and then green, perhaps making copper oxide or something. I'm not sure what the chemical compound was. But um, I accidentally hooked the polarity up backwards one day and saw firsthand what happens. Now, the amperage that will pump through this when you hook it up backwards is nearly twice that. So there is definitely some crazy chemical reaction going on, and it will turn the water blue almost instantly. I just wanted to share one more very important, interesting detail with these cells. This was um, a project I was working on. About a year ago I haven't really had time to mess with it but basically I decided to make the cathode a little bit bigger because the actual unit that I built is not it's similar in proportion to, to this drawing this is a larger cathode that I plan to put in there and I was going to drill holes in it like this one here just kind of shown as we see it's like um, in rows so that the current could pass through easily and gas could also escape and um, actually this is not slid in but the bottom is going to have really big holes like this so the electrolyte could flow in good and um, these little holes here would just let current through and gas escape but one of the important things that I wanted to bring up is the reason why I wanted to get these electrode sizes as proportionate as possible is because in electrolysis when you start messing around with the ratio to active surface area in proportion to anode and cathode, secondary reactions take place. Very exotic electrolysis cells that generate substances like hydrogen peroxide, ozone, isopropyl alcohol, and things like that, pure oxygen gas, those all use electrolysis cells that have for instance, a very small anode and a very large cathode. The disproportionality causes the buildup of anions versus caissons and vice versa and all of that mumbo jumbo and things like that. So, for instance, if you were to put um, acetone in an electrolysis cell and alter the, electro the, the plate sizes, you generate isopropyl alcohol in the electrolysis process. Um, you can make hydrogen peroxide with water using electrolysis and the way they do that is um, with these exotic cells that have these different size plates. Now that may not necessarily be required in all cases but if you look into some of the old books on the subject very interesting things happen when you start toying around with the anode to cathode active surface area proportions. So that's an important thing to take into consideration and very interesting stuff. So hope I can cram this into the video. But this is just something that I never finished. I have thousands of very cool, never finished 
drawings of machines that I will never have the money to build. Um, I think this is what I'm currently working on here is a new high-powered cell. Well, I'm babbling. We're going to cut this out.